The New Orleans, Jackson, and Great Northern was a 206-mile-long railway originally commissioned by the state of Illinois, with both Stephen Douglas and Abraham Lincoln being among its supporters in the 1851 Illinois legislature. It connected Canton, Mississippi, with New Orleans and was completed just prior to the Civil War. And it was obviously to run from New Orleans, you know, up the corridor, you know, across what we know as Manchac today, straight up the line, you know, through Osaka, et cetera, on to Jackson, Mississippi. And what they did is they put at every 10-mile stop a watering station. And so here came the development of, of Tanchbo Parish. You know, you hit Ponchatoula, then Tickfaw, then a meet, then Tanchbeho. And so all of those became the original communities uh, of what today we would know as Tanchbeho Parish. And they developed according to what was set up around them. For example, a meet took off very dramatically, not just because it was a developing market community already, but it was at the epicenter of the parish. It had connecting roads going across both east and west. And now when you put the railroad in, there was a big impetus to grow there. And so people began pouring into that area, particularly entrepreneurs from East Baton Rouge Parish, from the Felicianas and places like that. A lot of them began to relocate there. A lot began to come up from New Orleans too. Many of them settled in the Ponchatoula area and other spots where these railroad stop watering stations were setting up. And people don't appreciate today how many trains there were. You could, you could live in Hammond and commute to New Orleans by train. And an awful lot of people here did that. So that's busily chugging along. And, you know, the railroad comes through between 1852 and it actually begins operating in 1854. They endured a couple of massive yellow fever epidemics. The yellow fever epidemic of 1853 simply decimated the crews working on the railroad and set work back as everybody fled for their lives. Eventually things, the temperature cooled and the mosquitoes as we know died off. They had no idea what was causing it at that time, but we know now. And work resumed and so the railroad was eventually completed. Then came the war. The area that would be Tangipahoa Parish played an important part in the Civil War. Confederates clashed with Union troops in every major destination along the railroad. However, perhaps its most notable contribution is with Camp Moore. Today it is a museum, but during the war it was the largest Confederate training camp in Louisiana. The base was named for Louisiana Governor Thomas Overton Moore and was authorized by Confederate President Jefferson Davis. The camp opened in May 1861 as a site to organize, train, and disperse soldiers from Louisiana to all points of the Confederacy. Camp Moore saw as many as 35,000 men cross its grounds and then on to war. Camp Moore was the largest Confederate training base in this area, and it may have been one of the largest in the entire South. Initially, they were training the Confederate troops in New Orleans, and very quickly they found that as they're bringing all these country boys down into the New Orleans area, and let's say the sultry delights of New Orleans are leading to a lot of drunken debauchery, a lot of syphilis and other sexually transmitted diseases, plus an absence of a good, clean drinking water source and enough land, enough dry, high ground to where you can maneuver hundreds if not thousands of troops, cause them to look for another site. They found one about a half a mile north of the village of Tanchbeho there, and troops from all over this region came there and to be trained, and it included some of our most notable units from Louisiana. Uh, among them, of course, was Roberto Wheats, Louisiana Tigers, you know, who, you know, famously drank all the whiskey in the town before they left. Several of them were killed and injured, falling off the train. They were so drunk and they would stop and loot whiskey stores as they headed north from there. But it wasn't just them, you know, the 4th Louisiana Infantry Regiment, the 16th, the 27th, 
And of course, it, it was the subject of uh, raids by the Federals all the time. It was the epicenter of the Confederate effort to retake Baton Rouge, and that's a very famous story in itself. John C. Breckinridge, the former Vice President of the United States, comes south with a small Confederate army to try to retake Baton Rouge. He hoped that when he got to Camp Moore, he would pick up as many as 5,000 additional troops, but when he got there, a measles epidemic was raging. So he got barely less than half of what he'd hoped for. And then they begin this arduous march from Camp Moore there at Tanchpahoe, Louisiana, to Baton Rouge in the August heat. And there was little water for them. They were drinking from mud holes and stagnant ponds on the way. And what's really interesting about that is when they arrived, the commander of the forces, Breckinridge, wrote, we were augmented by hundreds of men and boys who came out with their scroll rifles and joined the army as they did, wanting to get a crack at the Yankees. They almost took the city, but for the firepower of the Union warships in the Mississippi, and one of the first people killed, of course, on the Confederate side, wearing the gray uniform, was Mary Todd Lincoln's brother. So President Abraham Lincoln's brother-in-law was one of the first people killed at the in, in this fighting at Baton Rouge, which had originated at Camp Moore. Many people who served in the, uh, in the Civil War for, that are from this area went through Camp Moore, and not many of them served in Port Hudson, which was biggest battle in anywhere near this area. Yeah. There was Civil War action in this area. They were stationed in New Orleans, and the infamous Ben Butler was the commanding general there, and Butler was known to want to steal everything he could get his hands on. And he heard there was a lot of cotton up here. So he sent an army up the tracks, and they got to Ponchatoula, and they burned Ponchatoula down except for the Masonic Hall because their commander was a mason. Ponchatoula was attacked twice, and there was very good reason for that. You know, Ponchatoula had initially served as a small base of operations for the Confederates. Then once New Orleans fell, they made it a much bigger base for the Confederates, and it was designed to be the launch pad for the Confederates' effort to retake New Orleans. And they even brought down the famed Missouri Confederate General M. Jeff Thompson, and he, along with Daniel Ruggles and others, set up this impressive camp near the railroad there in Ponchatoula. And the Yankees, of course, determined to hang on to New Orleans, were very aggressive. And so they attacked Ponchatoula in 1862, then came back in a multi-pronged attack on Ponchatoula in 1863 and devastated the town. In fact, Major Bacon, you know, who was one of the leading federal officers there, in his own words, in, in his autobiography, he says, the legendary savagery of the Turks could not have been more thorough than what we did to Ponchatoula that day. So this wasn't, you know, this isn't something we talk about a lot around here anymore. But the Federals came in and they basically laid waste the town. And they hung around until a train had pulled forward and seen what was happening in the town. It went backing up the railroad with its whistle blowing the whole way to Camp Moore and loaded up. And the joke always was so many of them were wanting to get a crack at the Yankees that they were hanging on by their fingertips to the outside of the train getting down there. And as those men were brought down, the Yankees withdrew and went back down the railroad towards New Orleans. The Confederates retook the town. But Punch Tula wasn't the only spot that saw fighting. So so around 1861, Charles Cate arrives, sets up his shoe factory, and he begins the construction of both the shoe factory itself, but also a timber mill, which they, as they cleared the area, they used the products of the timber, and he built a big boarding house for his workers, and a couple of more buildings rose up in connection with that, homes and the like. That then, of course, made this a target of the Yankees when they did come. And later in 1862, they did reach Hammond. And sure enough, they did take the town, they burned the shoe factory, destroyed all of the machinery, uh, did everything they could to damage the infrastructure of the, the fledgling community there, and it, it was a horrific event for them. But when you keep in mind that at least 80% of the Confederate Army was barefoot by the end of the war, you realize just how important those were. And of course, C.E. Cates Factory gives rise to the town we know today as Hammond. During the raids up and down the railroad during the course of the war, there was a railroad repair facility at Uncle Sam, of course, which later, as we said, became Independence. And there was a sharp fight there. The Confederates were determined to try to hang on 
to that railroad repair facility, you know, being able to move troops and supplies along the railroads was critically important to him. So they did what they could, and what was notable about that fight was how many citizens came out and joined the handfuls of Confederate soldiers that were trying to contest the advance of the Yankees in that fighting. They moved on up the railroad to Aim Eat, on to Tanchimaho and others, burning the depots, uh, destroying the railroad. In fact, here in the center, we have one fragment of a bit of the railroad, which they had, you know, as they often did, heated up parts of the railroads and would wrap them around trees. You often hear those called Sherman's neckties and everything to make it to where they could not reuse that iron because getting metal like that and iron for railroad and to repair the locomotives and things like that was extremely difficult in the blockaded south. So hanging onto those resources was very important to them.